thank you so much for allowing me to take part in this event. It really feels like there's been a call to arms for the Egyptological community during the lockdown with the amount of material and resources that are being shared. So thank you so much. I wanted to start with this quote from Winlock, who discovered an undisturbed chamber in the tomb of Mekhet Ray in 1920 in Thebes, dating to the 11th dynasty. It really sums up for me the charm of the little wooden funerary figures. The beam of light shot into a little world of 4,000 years ago, and as I was gazing down into the midst of a myriad of brightly painted little men going this way and that, a tall, slender girl gazed at me, perfectly composed. A gang of little men with sticks in their upraised hands drove spotted oxen. Rowers tugged at their oars on a fleet of boats, while one ship seemed foundering right in front of me with its bow balanced precariously in the air. And all this busy coming and going was in uncanny silence, as though the distance back over the 40 centuries I looked across was too great for even an echo to reach my ears. For the purposes of this talk, I'm using the term wooden funerary figure to refer to artifacts identified as tomb models, servant figures, serving figures and cast statues amongst others. I refer to wooden anthropomorphic figures in human form, typically less than 500 millimetres tall and found in a funerary context. Within this categorization, I include figures that originate from models and also small wooden statues of the tomb owner, the two main subsites of the figures held by the Egypt Centre. We have to remember to exercise caution when casually applying classifications to objects from other civilizations. It's highly unlikely that our ideas of classification from our etic perspective correlate with those of the ancient Egyptians. The examples from the tomb of Mekhet Ray are probably the most well known due to their finely carved features and good state of preservation. Mekhet Ray served as high steward during the reigns of Montuhotep I and II, and possibly also Amenhotep I. He was buried in the Theban necropolis in tomb 280. The objects were found in an undisturbed side chamber, and they are now shared between the Metropolitan and Cairo Museum. These figures are so well known, in fact, there's even a knitting pattern replicating the dress of one of the offering bearers, which my mum is knitting for me whilst she's in lockdown. These figures start to appear in burial assemblages during the 6th dynasty and continue to be produced until the reign of Sinwazrit III in the 12th dynasty. The general consensus is that these models and figures could act as a magical substitute for the activity being portrayed, such as food production, Nile travel via boat, or in the case of the figures, of the tomb owner to act as a substitute for the deceased. Figures appear across Egypt, particularly at sites such as Memphis, Beni Hassan, Azut, Thebes, Mir and Sedment, although issues of preservation mean that it's difficult to build up an accurate representation of where the figures were included. In Giza, for example, no figures survived due to a white ant infestation which destroyed nearly all of the wooden material. There's relatively little interest in the figures, in academic spheres. This was notably the case in the early days of Egyptology, meaning excavation reports provide precious little information about the wooden figures unless they are particularly fine examples. In fact, during the excavations at Naga Adair, it is reported that funerary figures and models were discarded and buried in a pit rather than wasting the effort of recording them, much to my annoyance. You do, however, find a lot of figures in private collections as a result of the antiquities trade. The figures are light, small, and easily transported, making them ideal souvenirs for tourists and collectors. One such collector was Henry Welcome, whose collection makes up a large percentage of the figures in the Egypt Centre. The museum is home to around 70 figures in various shapes, sizes, and states of preservation, a little different to the models known from the tomb of Mekhet Ray. We have no intact models and no known provenance for any of the objects. We do have one model boat with three passengers, but this was examined by Anne Merriman and deemed to be either a fake or a highly modified example. I'm just going to show you W361. It's a really interesting piece. The figures and some of the elements of the boat do appear to be genuine ancient Egyptian artifacts, but the model as it now appears has been cobbled together from other pieces. Most notably, the terminals of the boat are very unusual and the paint is suspiciously fresh for an ancient artifact. The boat is currently at Cardiff University undergoing conservation. Interestingly, in a series of correspondence from 1921 between Petrie, who was excavating in sediment, and Guy Maynard, the director at Ipswich Museum at the time, Maynard specifies his discontent at the lack of models the museum received in return for their £30 donation to the excavation fund. 
The correspondence concludes with Petrie stating, I'm happy to say that we've been able to repair a boat, granary and group. He also notes that all the boats had to be packed in separate pieces and built up again on arrival. It is with this in mind we mustn't take for granted that even models with a known provenance may still not appear as they would have on internment and may be subjected to more recent freshening up or errors in reassembly. That being said, unprovenanced and incomplete material presents a far greater range of challenges that do not occur when working with undisturbed material. It's impossible to say if objects in our collection are from the same model, the same site or even genuine and it also becomes difficult to determine the activity the figure is carrying out. For example, if you had the scribes board shown here on the lap of the central figure in your collection without its context, would you be able to identify what it was and where it came from? Since much of the corpus of wooden figures in museums is unprovenanced and with more and more material emerging from private collections at auction, being able to include this unprovenanced material in studies, as long as due caution is exercised and acknowledged, could change our views on these objects and their inclusion in ancient Egyptian funerary practices. My starting point for trying to find out more about these figures was the work of Angela Tooley and Jason Eschenbrenner-Dima, who catalogue in great detail wooden funerary models. Obviously, for both of these PhDs, the focus leans towards provenance and more complete models. These works, amongst others, have given me the opportunity to familiarise myself with the material from known provenances and to build upon the typologies to identify stylistic traits which will help me to identify likely geographic and temporal provenance for the Egypt Centre examples, as well as hopefully identifying the activity the figure may have been engaged in. To sum up what I'm trying to do, Egyptologists have used figures of known provenance as evidence to support their research resulting in a typology of stylistic traits for these figures, deriving from morphometric study. I intend, through the analysis of their work, to use their typologies to provide likely provenance for our unidentified figures. This will never be an exact science and can only ever be a likely origin, with calculated reasoning behind the assumptions. I'm basically trying to formalise something those working with ancient material do on a regular basis, using their existing knowledge to make assumptions about the origins of an object using the evidence available. If we look at this example, I'm sure most of you can use your past expertise to know which one of these is the fake. But this one might be a little bit harder to be sure. The one on the left is the original in Berlin and the one on the right is our replica in the Egypt Centre. But back to the figures. The logical first step was to create a complete catalogue of all the wooden funerary figures, collating the known information held by the museum and getting the data in the most accessible format. This would have been impossible without the help and support of the amazing staff at the Egypt Centre, in particular Dr Ken Griffin. Each figure has undergone a condition report, had measurements taken, been photographed by Ken in high resolution from several angles and checked for any small detail that may provide clues as to their provenance. As you may remember from a previous lecture on the Chen Tealing tour, any Egypt Centre objects that came from the collector Henry Welcome typically have a welcome number associated them which then correlates to a welcome slip. This may provide details of the auction from which the object was purchased and the condition of the object at the time. These slips aren't without their challenges, however. You may be able to spot the issue with welcome slip 65928, which is assigned to this group of arms. As you can see from the picture, there are 31 arms assigned to this welcome number, but only five are mentioned on the slip then followed a long process of checking the slips against the figures for accuracy. Not all of the slips are assigned correctly, which may be the result of the mismatching of objects on arrival in the 1970s and objects being reassigned to slips when labels had become detached through a process of elimination. The Egypt Centre also holds object files for each object in their archives. These contain paper copies of condition checks, old photographs and labels, and any other relevant paperwork relating to the item in question. A record card also exists for each object, the precursor of the online database. The welcome slips, old labels and other archival material associated with an object can often give vital clues such as auction details, which can then be referred back to the auction catalogue. This may include, if we're very lucky, an image or description of the item, which can indicate original groupings of objects or provenance. Unfortunately, this is the rarely the case when dealing with this category of material. My next task was to tackle a box in the stores I affectionately refer to as the armory. It includes a multitude of small wooden elements, predominantly arms of funerary figures, 
but also legs, bases, oars, and other accessories, although the oars have now been moved to a new box that I refer to as the oratorium. The addition of missing limbs to the figures has numerous benefits. It means we can match an erroneous welcome slip if the details mention specific limbs. The limb may provide a stylistic trait, crucial for identifying the provenance of a figure, and it's also just really satisfying to return part of an object that's been separated for several decades. Although we had some guesses as to likely candidates for the matching of the missing limbs, the only way to be certain was to examine the figures in person. Ken and I spent several days checking through all the figures and matching the missing limbs to their owners. We expected to find a few matches, but this proved even more successful than we anticipated. As a result, in January 2020, 19 limbs, two bases, 20 arms, one leg and two feet were all taken to Cardiff University's Conservation Department for reattachment to their missing figures. This work is possible thanks to a grant from the AIM Pilgrim Trust Conservation Scheme. We had hoped to have the figures back in April, but obviously due to the current situation, the work is on hold. Another avenue I've explored to help me find out more about wooden funerary figures has been really enlightening. Alistair Parks is a woodworker based in Bristol and it turns out a Swansea University alumni. He has previous experience of researching and replicating ancient woodworking tools, including those specifically from ancient Egypt. He was able to help me with questions about the varying skill levels of the carpenter and the possible reasons behind decisions made in the manufacture process. For example, I was curious why in some of the figures, the feet are not carved and instead built up in gesso, which is often lost to the ravages of time. He pointed out that when you look at the grain of the wood, these extremities would be prone to weaknesses and likely snap off as shown in W435. Speaking to someone who has experience of working with similar tools and materials to that which would have been utilised in the creation of these figures really made me consider things such as the direction of the grain, weak points in the figures and the type of wood and joints used. Alistair was about to start work on a replica of one of these figures for me, recording the manufacturing process at each step, but unfortunately now that's something that will have to wait. So whilst I'm waiting for my replica, I was wondering about the level of skill that went into some of the cruder models. Were these more basic figures the work of skilled artisans, or could they be a DIY job by the family of the deceased? Save for the investment into the wood, which was obviously quite a scarce commodity, what level of training might be needed to create one of these figures? So this is a lockdown version of experimental archaeology, so you'll have to forgive a few unconventional deviations from authenticity. I started with some wood I'd picked up on a dog walk and some tiny chisels for pottery sculpting. Save for chatting about the ways in which these figures may have been made with Alistair, I have absolutely zero knowledge past GCSE woodwork. I've never tried woodworking or whittling and I deliberately didn't watch any tutorials or have any of the images in front of me, but the results weren't too bad. I had to compromise on the type of wood used, which certainly wasn't fig or acacia, and I didn't have any copper chisels to hand, but the process gave me a much better appreciation of the manufacture process, even if not entirely accurate. I used artist gesso and acrylic paint to finish, and here's the end result. Obviously, he's very rough due to the poor quality wood and inexperienced carpenter, but I'm quite proud of him and I actually did learn quite a lot from this experiment. I spent probably an hour to an hour and a half working on him. One of the key lessons learned was if you don't wait for the gesso to dry, you get little white bubbles and smears in the paint, which is something I've actually seen on the Egypt Centre figures, and also how difficult it is to attach the arms in place without splitting the wood. It was also valuable to see the difference in trying to work with and against the grain and why therefore the grain usually runs vertically through the figures. So in answer to my initial question I set myself, not a massive level of skill or investment of time was required for these cruder figures. Now that's clearly not the case with some of the more ornate examples, such as the figure on the right, but it does raise questions about the level of skill involved. Next, I'd like to show you some of my research into a couple of the groups of wooden funerary figures. I'm starting with a complete failure as these guys have me completely stumped. They all seem to be from a slightly different wood to the majority of the other figures. They are crudely carved and have a notch carved out at groin level. If anyone has any suggestions as to whether they're even Egyptian, please do get in touch. Although we have several figures that on first glance probably originate from Beni Hassan, these two have a lot of the, figure, the features typical of figures from this region that were being produced during the Middle Kingdom high-waisted trousers, cheek-length bobs, large eyes, and Benny Hassan bums where the buttocks are very defined from the torso. 
W687 has to be spoken about as he's my favourite figure. Whilst he was being recatalogued, we spotted 380 written on his back in pencil in a similar hand to other objects we know to originate from Garstan's Beni Hassan uh, excavations. The welcome slip indicates that he was bought at auction by welcome from the McGregor collection. Reverend William McGregor was one of the sponsors of the Beni Hassan excavations and as such received a portion of the excavated material. So I checked the excavation report and sure enough, tomb 380 did contain figures from a boat and a brewing scene. Without further information, it's impossible to say whether W687 originated from one of these models. But since finding his arm in the armory and noting the outstretched positioning, it seems more likely he was part of the brewing scene. W688 has been grouped with the figures likely to be two Mona statues. Frustratingly, we don't have the welcome slip and it's not available online, but the label attached to the figure does give us his welcome number, which we were then able to look up in one of the welcome notebooks shown here. We found both the leg and the base for this statue, which means post constellation he will be complete. It's a really finely carved statue and save for the base made from entirely one piece of wood, likely acacia. The use of just one piece of wood rather than using dowel joints covered in gesso is much less common and takes a massive level of skill on the art, part of the artist. Julia Harvey discusses a pair of very similar figures to ours from the tomb of Chateti in a private collection in the Netherlands. She notes from the excavation reports held by the Griffith Institute that two additional statues recorded from this tomb are now lost. I had hoped that our figure may have been one of the missing ones, but on viewing the excavation reports, W688 is unfortunately not a match. In spite of this, additional statues inscribed with the names and titles of Jatefi, not mentioned in the excavation reports, have come to light in other collections, such as the Metropolitan and the Louvre. So it's not impossible that ours may not have been recorded at the time of excavation. I'd love to say that this figure is Chateti, and I think that I can confidently say that this figure dates to the 6th dynasty and Saqqara, and it is in all likelihood the work of the same craftsperson. This next group of four figures are stylistically Theban 12th dynasty, and finely carved with very similar features. But are they all from the same provenance? The welcome slip states that there should only be three figures, not four in this group. The first clue to identifying the odd one out was the slip description mentioning two on modern bases. And as you can see, all the figures have very lumpy gesso on their feet. I had spotted that we had some bases of the right size in the stores and crucially with traces of gesso still remaining. Sure enough, two of the figures match perfectly onto these bases, allowing a confident match to the slip. Next, if I could find an unmatched welcome slip for the erroneous figure, it would help in determining the imposter. Luckily, as the slips are available online, by trawling through the records, I was able to find a likely match, which mentions the figure walking with its left arm missing. This one is also very slightly shorter than the others, but sold by the same auction house in the same year. And the last group of figures I'd like to talk about, I've nicknamed the squatting scribes. They're all of a similar size and position with closely cropped hair and a hole in the hand to hold an implement, which I assumed to be a reed pen. The welcome slips for these were an issue as the sizes weren't corresponding to the figures. As luck would have it, Ken found a list referring to the figures in the material being moved to the Egypt Centre's new archive room. The list refers to all the objects that were checked off from case 6772, each referred to by their welcome numbers. 114173 to 176 were assigned to four of the squatting scribes, but 114172 wasn't associated with any of the objects. Looking at the five slips, they all described very similar figures purchased from the same auction in 1928, although 114 to 172 is slightly different as it mentions the figure in this instance as squatting before a milling stone. So we now had five slips for five figures in theory, but none of the sizes seemed to correspond. All of the sizes were approximately one inch too large and seemed to apply to a longer, deeper object. The descriptions were also very vague. The only possible explanation we could come up with was that these figures may have had bases that may have been associated with the figures in the past. In the Egypt Centre stores, we sorted all the objects that could be potentially a wooden base, something that's very hard to determine as they're often made from recycled wood and very often mistaken for coffin fragments. As a result, we were able to rejig some of the assigned slips to more likely figures and identify two likely bases. Another task in the future will be to go through all the fragments of wood labelled as coffin fragments to see if any correspond with the remaining sizes on the slips. 
One evening, as I was scrolling through some images of wooden funerary figures, which is something I'm sure you all do, I saw an image that reminded me of a weird awe I'd seen in the oratorium. It's catalogued as a leaf-shaped awe. And this weird awe was very similar to the fowl being cooked by the figure shown from the Cairo Museum. Unfortunately, the end of the stick is broken off in the Egypt Centre example, and so it's difficult to know how long it would have been. It has traces of pinkish and red gesso as per the Cairo example, and the same bulbous part where the goose or duck joins the stick, which does not occur on oars. But why is there a hole through the middle? This could possibly be to affix it to another element of the model, increase the surface area to allow the gesso to attach, or it may just be a reused piece of wood. However, I've now discarded the latter theory, as I've found another example with a hole through it. It dates from the 9th to 10th dynasty and was found at Naga Adair and is now housed in the Phoebe Atherton Hearst Museum of Anthropology in Berkeley, California. And this still isn't the end of the story for the group. As I was looking for another arm for a completely different figure, I spotted this piece of wood in the box. It's described in the catalogue as a bottle stopper and it's about the same size and shape as a wine cork. But on closer examination, the object has a dowel in the bottom and textured gesso on the top. We carefully trialled the scene of figure W445, an arm that we matched to this figure, the roasting fowl and this object. Many of the comparative examples show a much flatter dish brazier, but the texture and colouring on the top really resembles coals when you view it in person. It could alternatively be a vat of some description, but it does seem to fit nicely with this arrangement. Another future part of my research will be to look at the tomb reliefs of food production and try and find a comparative example. The combined scene then gives the correct measurements, if allowing for a base, to match welcome slip 114172. Could this item be the milling stone mentioned on the slip misinterpreted? And there's one final element associated with these figures that I need to investigate further. My first thought was that it may be a rudder, but it appears to be very similar to a paddle or fan used in similar food production models. This example here shown is from the Ashmolean in Oxford. You may be able to see the black paint on the surface, which looks quite feathery, so it may possibly be a fan. My research into these objects is ongoing, but I hope you've enjoyed this quick summary of some of the ways I've been trying to find out more about these figures. I have a lot more work to do, but my aim was to highlight the ways in which we can incorporate unprovenanced material into research. Many of you have already donated to the Egypt Centre Support Fund and have likely already received your PDF copy of the new booklet on the left. If you haven't done so, I highly recommend it as an introduction to the collection. My only criticism of the booklet is that it doesn't include a single funerary figure, and so my hope over the next three months, once I finish my dissertation, is to produce a booklet for the Egypt Centre focusing specifically on the figures. I want to say a massive thank you to all of the staff at the Egypt Centre, to whom I'm immensely grateful for the amazing level of support they provide to myself and the other students and volunteers. Please do give generously to the Egypt Centre Support Fund. The museum relies heavily on educational visits, shop sales and donations as their main source of income, and so is greatly affected by the ongoing closure. Also, please do consider signing up to the five-week course, The Funerary Artifacts of Ancient Egypt. Using the objects as a way of accessing the past is so effective and it really brings the course content to life. Thank you.